Okay, here we go. 7.1 atoms and isotopes. This is the start of nuclear energy. And I think this is a cool unit. By the end, you're going to be doing nuclear physics, where you can actually calculate. You're going to be using the equation E equals mc squared. You can calculate what Einstein was cal calculating himself. It's pretty fun stuff. So this first lesson, mostly, almost entirely review. Just recapping what you should know from science class, chemistry class, this sort of thing. So to start, we need to make sure you remember the Bohr-Rutherford model of the atom. So it's this idea where we have um, these circles. And the center circle is our nucleus, the one that's red in this picture here. And it says 2p plus and 2n0. So this is our nucleus, and it's just um, the center part. And it's filled with protons and neutrons. And I say filled, but it's just there isn't any nucleus. It just is where all the protons and neutrons are packed together. That's what the nucleus is. It's not like there's some sort of sphere that you just toss them all inside of. The nucleus is the collection of protons and neutrons at the center. All right. So that's our nucleus. And you can see uh, we have two examples of atoms here. Helium. Well, helium has two protons and two neutrons. So you can see that that's what we have in our nucleus. And it also has two electrons, which are outside here. And we have fluorine here. And fluorine has nine protons, 10 neutrons. That's what goes in the nucleus here. And since it has no nine protons, it needs to have the same number of electrons. Hopefully that's familiar for you. Nine protons, nine electrons. And you can count them up. We have two here in this first shell. Then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Comes out to nine total. So speaking of shells, what is a shell? Shells are the energy states. of the electrons. And we like to draw them as these nice circles around the nucleus to say, oh, well, here's, here's shell number one, there's shell number one, and here's shell number two. And there's these nice little circles, and the electrons go around in these circles. Not really how it works. Um, really, they're the energy states. So we say that two of these electrons are operating at the lowest energy. And then so they have the lowest potential energy. The ones that are further, they have more potential energy. And you can think of it just like gravitational potential energy. The further you are from the center of the Earth, you have more gravitational potential energy. And same with these shells. So as you go out, you have more energy. So over here, we have just a table of the different shells and how many electrons you can put in each. So maybe you remember, your first shell only gets two electrons. The second shell can have eight. And you do them in this sort of paired way. Um, well, first you do one, two, three, four, all separate. You do like one. Um, well, anyway, uh, so you know, you know how this all works. So we've got our different shells, different electrons. We've got excited states. So here's an example of an excited state here. This guy. There's only one electron. Normally that one electron would be, would be down here. But he's moved up. And that's just because he's in, a, in an excited state. Excited state is when, um, so this is electrons are at higher energy states. Than the ground, than the ground state. So the ground state is where it normally would want to be. It wants to go down as far as it can, but sometimes it gets excited and it goes up, right? And that's when it gets some energy, it gets bumped up. So if, for instance, you have some light, a photon is just coming in here, it smacks into that electron, it gives that electron some extra energy. So it pops up for a second. 
and after a while it falls back down and it emits that light again to go on somewhere else because light is just energy. So that's that's sort of what's going on with our excited state. Okay, last thing on this page is a little picture uh, from the periodic table. So hopefully you remember um, the periodic table. We've got our atomic number, which is the number of protons and it's unique for each element. The number of protons tells us what element it is. If it has nine protons, it is fluorine. That's just how it works. If it has two, it's helium. One, it's hydrogen. That's just automatic. So we have a different name for each number of protons. That's the atomic number. And our mass number is the number of protons plus the number of electrons. Or sorry, not the number of electrons. Number of protons plus number of neutrons. And it sort of tells us how heavy that thing is. Because protons and neutrons, they have a certain amount of mass. Electrons have way less mass. So for the mass number, we don't include the, the how much electrons we have. So you can see down here we have the mass number. In this case, it's 19. So if it's 19 and we have nine protons, well, I can say the number of neutrons is equal to 19 minus 9, so we have 10 neutrons. That's how we find out how many neutrons there are in, a, uh, in something. We take its total mass and we subtract how many protons it has. All right, and the units for mass, for the mass number, are these normalized units where one is basically the mass of a proton or a neutron. Neutrons and protons are about the same mass. There's all sorts of gray area there, but anyway, we'll go on to the next page and we'll talk about isotopes. So an isotope is when um, is an, an element that has the same atomic number but a different number of neutrons. different number of neutrons. That's an isotope. So you know, if it has nine protons, that's fluorine, but it could have ten neutrons. That's the normal number of neutrons for fluorine. It could also have ten, uh, eleven or twelve or thirteen. It could have any number of neutrons. And those are all different isotopes. The different isotopes have different rarities. Sometimes they're very common and sometimes they're less common. So. Um, here we have an example of carbon-12. That's the, the normal carbon. That's the, the naturally occurring type of carbon. And you can see that we have six protons and six neutrons. Um, and to figure out the number of neutrons, well, the way it works is we take this number 12, that's its mass number, 12 minus 6, that's how many protons there are. It gives us that there are six neutrons remaining. Now for carbon-14, you can see, well, carbon-14, we call it carbon-14 because it has a mass of 14. We take that 14, subtract how many protons there are, and we get that there are 8 neutrons. So here, this is our number of neutrons. All right, that's, that's how we figure out how many neutrons there are. So those are isotopes, and... Hopefully those, those ring a bell. Hopefully you've seen those before. Now there's one special type of isotope that's worth talking a bit more about. It's the isotopes of hydrogen. So hydrogen, it has two very important isotopes. So to start with, hydrogen normally has one proton, one electron, and no neutrons. That's what's normal. No neutrons. And so if we were to write it, it looks like 1, 1, H. Where, remember, the, um, the one on the bottom here is 
the atomic number, how many protons there are, and the one on the top is the mass number. So if the mass and the, the atomic number are the same, that means there's no neutrons. Cool. So that's hydrogen. Now we have a special uh, isotope called deuterium, and this is 2,1H, which has one neutron. And deuterium, deuter, it's, it's, um, I don't know what, I don't remember what language it is, but it has to do with the number two. And tritium, well, try three, so, so you can guess that it has a mass of three. Three, one, H, which has two neutrons. So deuterium and tritium, they're very special, um, Deuterium is naturally occurring, so it's pretty common. I if you drink a glass of water, some of uh, that water is going to be made up of deuterium um, particles. So naturally occurring. It's obviously not as common as regular hydrogen, but it's, you know, it's not that unusual. Tritium is a lot rarer, and basically we have to make tritium, and there are ways to do that. Now, why would we make deuterium and tritium, both of these things are used to make heavy water. Okay, and heavy water is, um, well, remember, water is H2O. So there's two hydrogens in there. And if we change those hydrogens with deuterium or tritium, well, that means that that water is going to have more mass. There's going to be more neutrons in there, and it's going to be heavier, which makes it more dense. And it means that it's going to slow things down more. It would be, for instance, uh, very different trying to swim in a bunch of deuterium or tritium water. Um, and it's especially useful for nuclear reactors. And earlier I told you Canadian nuclear reactors are way better than American ones. That's because um, Canadian reactors use heavy water in part of the process, which changes things a lot. It, it makes it a lot more efficient, um, and there's lots of, lots of reasons why that's good. So Canadian nuclear reactors use heavy water. And so to get that heavy water, we can just sort of refine it. We can, we can take regular water and just find all the heavier stuff. And, um, and to get the, the extra tritium, I mean, we, we can sort of manufacture that. But generally, we just purify the water. We, we find the heaviest stuff. OK. So that's hydrogen. That's its, um, its isotopes. And deuterium and tritium, they're, they're important to know about. All right, the next thing here, the periodic table. Well, you know what it is. It lists. Um, well, it lists all the the elements, but wh what I want to say here is on the topic of isotopes, it lists the most commonly occurring isotope. So where where it tells you the mass of carbon, for instance. That's the mass of the most commonly occurring isotope. But there are other isotopes that will have different mass. And so that's just important to remember. When you're looking up the mass of something in the periodic table, that's not telling you the mass for any of the isotopes. It's just telling you the mass for the regular carbon, or the regular fluorine, or whatever it is you're looking up. If you want to find the mass for an isotope, you would need to go to, to a different resource. There are resources that you can use for that. All right, um, we've got one little problem here. It says, draw the Bohr-Rutherford diagram for silicon 31. So silicon, the mass is 31. When we say silicon 31, it means that's the mass. And for this, we need to pop over to our periodic table. You will get one of these. I'm going to pop over to my periodic table, and I want to find silicon. Well, silicon, I can't draw on this one here, but it's number 14. You can see it's over on the right here, beside aluminum and phosphorus, underneath carbon. Silicon 14. So we just needed to look at our periodic table to find that there's 14 protons in that guy. Its atomic number is 14. OK, so then to get the number of neutrons, 
it's going to be 31 minus 14, which is 17. There are 17 neutrons in silicon. So we need all of that information to draw our picture. So first I draw my nucleus. And we've got 14, oops, I'm going to make that a bit, a bit larger here. Got 14 protons, and we've got 17 neutrons. Ooh, and I did P0. I meant to do a P plus there, and N0. The plus and the zero, that just means the proton has a positive charge. Ne neutrons don't have any electrical charge. Okay, I draw my first shell here, and I put on two electrons. I draw my second shell, and I put on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I'm up to ten total. I'm going to need another shell. So I'm at 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. There should be 14 electrons to match the 14 protons. That's it. That's our bohr rutherford diagram. Good. Okay, the very last piece here, medical applications for radioisotopes. So these are a type of isotope. So what is a radioisotope? It is an unstable isotope that will decay and release radiation. And I'm sure you've all heard the term radiation. When I talked about it in the last unit, I was talking about it just in general as heat energy. We get radiation from the sun. And radiation isn't always bad, but it can be. And you probably know that. So, so x-rays, for instance, you want to limit the amount of x-rays you expose yourself to. Um, nuclear radiation, well, there, we're going to see in a couple lessons the different types of radiation and how harmful they can be. So radioisotopes release, they, they're unstable, they release radiation. But it can be useful. They're not all bad either, these radioisotopes. So these are two useful applications. First one is nuclear medical Im uh, imaging. And the way this works is you inject a radioisotope. Radioisotope into a patient. And then you use the radiation to see internal problems. To see internal problems. So you can use this to see organs and that sort of thing. Things that x-rays can't see. Because x-rays, they just see your skeleton. They can't really focus on the the more fleshy tissues inside of you. So nuclear medi medical imaging can be really useful, and it is used all the time, to look at those things inside of you. The next thing, radionuclide therapy, RNT. Well, here we use radiation to target and kill target and kill that's a K there. Specific structures. And the obvious thing that we would use that for is to kill tumors. Okay, those are the specific structures we would want to target and kill. So that it can be useful. You can get these um, radionuclides in exactly the right place. So they're right up near the, um, the tumor and then they emit all their radiation which kills off the tumor and hopefully doesn't affect everything else around it. So you can see there are some use, uh, uses for this radiation. Okay, that's the end of the lesson. It's the start of nuclear energy. I'm excited. I hope you are too.